In this episode of Veterans AZ, we will meet three Arizonans, each with a unique connection to the Korean War. A United States Marine who served in Korea, a Korean American who has found new purpose in thanking the brave service members who fought to preserve a free country, and an Army veteran who joined well after the Korean War, but honors Korean War veterans today. We will also learn about the incredibly meaningful work being done by Hospice of the Valley and their veteran volunteers to honor veteran patients in their care. July 27, 1953 is an important day in history. After more than three years of fierce combat, an armistice was signed that day, ceasing hostilities in Korea. July 27 is National Korean War Armistice Day, recognizing veterans of the Korean War and those who made the ultimate sacrifice. This episode of Veterans AZ is dedicated to Korean War veterans, the 5.7 million who served, nearly 37,000 who gave their lives, and the nearly 8,000 whose fate in the Korean War remains unknown. My fellow citizens, tonight we greet with prayers of thanksgiving the official news that an armistice was signed almost an hour ago in Korea. It will quickly bring uh, to an end the fighting between the United Nations forces and the communist armies. For this nation, the cost of repelling aggression has been high. In thousands of homes, it has been incalculable. It has been paid in terms of tragedy. The special feelings of sorrow and of solemn gratitude, we think of those who were called upon to lay down their lives in that far off land to prove once again that only courage and sacrifice can keep freedom alive upon the earth. To the widows and orphans of this war, and to those veterans who bear disabling wounds, America renews tonight her pledge of lasting devotion and care. It is proper that we salute particularly the valorous armies of the Republic of Korea they have done even more than prove their right to freedom. In this struggle, we have seen the United Nations meet the challenge of aggression, not with pathetic words of protest, but with deeds of decisive purpose. It was my distinct pleasure to sit down with three fellow Arizonans to talk about the Korean War experience. Don Taylor is the current Arizona commander of the Korean War Veterans Association of Arizona. He served in theater with the United States Marine Corps during the Korean War. Susan Key is a Korean American who, after a successful corporate career, has dedicated herself to honoring and thanking the brave service members who fought to save her native land and Joel Stemple, a United States Army veteran who is not himself a veteran of the Korean War, but does work every day to serve Korean War veterans. Well, I'm joined by three very special guests today, uh, each of whom has a, a different and unique connection to the Korean War. Uh, first is Don Taylor, a United States Marine, a Korean War veteran, and 
current commander of the Korean War Veterans Association of Arizona. So welcome, Don. Thank you. Um, also with us is Joel Stemple. Joel is a United States Army veteran, and although not a Korean War veteran himself, he does volunteer his time with the Korean War Veterans Association and is the current commander of the General Brad Smith Ray Harvey chapter of the Korean War Veterans Association. Joel, welcome. Thank you. And uh, also with us is Susan Key, a Korean American writer and historian who has a deep personal connection to the Korean War and with our Korean War veterans and uh, spends a lot of her time honoring them. So thank you for being with us. Thank Susan. you for having me. Uh, Don, I'd like to start with you and, and just ask you to uh, tell us about your Korean War experience. I was in Korea at, at age 20. Actually, I was uh, worked out of Seoul, Korea, but I flew, at, I should say that I was an aircraft mechanic, and I flew all over Korea. The K sites at that time in a um, four ordered transport. We were actually in a support function. We supplied our troops. We hauled most everything. However, it was mostly tr troops. We did make uh, uh, contact with, uh, for example, in, you know, we flew mail runs to Haneda in Tokyo and uh, at the same time, we took care of our maintenance in, at basically out of Seoul. When you signed up for the Marines, is that what you expected to do? Is that where you expected to go? No, absolutely not. When I went, I wanted to be a Marine since I was 11 years old, and uh, I soon found out that they put you where you want, where they want you. That was the last thing in the world that I wanted to have anything to do with aviation. Later on, I went into security. However, that was for a short time period. When you look back on it now, how do you characterize your experience, or, or what do you what do you think about uh, when you look back on your on your time with the Marines in Korea? Well, I think that I did the right thing, or perhaps they did the right thing, because why walk when you can ride? So, to me, that was uh, very satisfying. At least I got to be a Marine. Maybe it wasn't what I wanted to be, but I did come home, and that was the main thing. And what was it like returning home uh, at that time? I was overseas for, we didn't call it deployed in those days. I was overseas for 20 months and three days. It was surreal. I flew from uh, San Francisco to Chicago, and I really didn't know what to do. It was totally different, but it soon I realized I was home, and it didn't take long to, con to, to, actually, I ended up being stationed at Great Lakes, and 40 days later, I exited the Marine Corps to civilian life, and uh, very happy to be, be here. And at what point in your life afterward did you become involved with the Korean War Veterans Association and, and, and think about how important it was to, to honor those who had served in Korea, such as, as yourself? Well, I actually joined other VSOs, veteran serv service organizations, before. I was uh, both uh, uh, Veterans Foreign Wars and American Legion prior to. The problem with the Korean War veterans at that time, it was the best kept secret that I'd ever see. I actually found out, it, found out about it at, uh, by accident. And I have been a member, I think, since uh, 2001. However, I had joined the other VSOs long before. Susan, I'd like to turn to you. Um, and you have a very deep personal connection uh, uh, to the Korean War. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, I guess simply put, I wouldn't be here without veterans like Mr. Taylor. He's the one who went to Korea to save my family from communism. And if not for our Korean War veterans, there's no way that any of us Koreans who live in freedom from North Korea's communist regime could be here. So I owe my life and my freedoms to all of our Korean War veterans and all those who never came home, the fallen heroes, and those are still missing from the Korean War. So to me, it's a very personal connection because every day I realize I am alive and free because of our Korean War veterans. 
Uh, my mom was uh, about nine years old and my dad was about 17 when the war started. So the war is not too far from my understanding of what happened in my birth country. Uh, I was born 13 years after the war and Korea was still very poor in the 60s. So uh, the war was always talked about in my family and uh, their stories have been handed down to me and uh, we've never forgotten that we were saved from uh, such an evil and tyrannical regime that still exists today in North Korea. So if Americans and other United Nations countries had not come to save us, I know that South Korea would have been swallowed by North Korean communist regime, and I wouldn't be standing here or sitting here with you today. So uh, I am so devoted to looking for veterans to thank because uh, I think that it's never too late to thank them. And uh, I know that the Korean War is always talked about as the forgotten war. And I don't like hearing that because for our family and all the veterans who fought and the families who lost loved ones in the Korean War, it's never going to be forgotten. So, um, so it is my passion now to make sure that people understand the legacy of our Korean War veterans, that they have given freedom to millions of Koreans like me. And so I will keep telling that story until everyone uh, really understands the gravity of what our Korean War veterans have done. They saved a country and a people from communism. And, and you share their stories, their personal stories. Yes. So, uh, via oh, I'm your sorry, Facebook I didn't page. answer that question. <laughs> so, when I started meeting the veterans, they started telling me their stories and showing me photos of Korea and telling me places I never even heard of in Korea. And I thought, wow, they're the best Korean War history, uh, history teachers. So, I started just sitting down with them and taping uh, their interview and interviewing them, asking them their stories, and they would bring out maps and photos and really educate me. And so, everything that I have learned, I've started to put on Facebook, on social media, because I wanted to share what I have received from the veterans and to educate the public about the Korean War and their legacy. So it's become a really uh, exciting journey that I never thought uh, I would be taking. And uh, to be even next to Mr. Taylor and to be able to give him a call and just talk to him as someone of a friend is really amazing because he's a hero. And I know so many heroes in my life, and I'm so grateful for this journey that I did not plan on, uh, that God led me to. Well, it's, it's great to see, and, and, and we really appreciate the work you're doing there. Um, I'd like to talk to you, uh, Joel, a little bit. As, as someone who is not yourself a Korean War veteran, you, you also have a, a personal connection, and you told me a, a story earlier of, of kind of when that connection began. Right. Uh, <clears throat> when I, was, I, I grew up in Virginia. And uh, <clears throat> on uh, June 25th, 1950, I was not quite eight, eight years old. And uh, I was driving with my dad, and we listened to the radio, and uh, President Truman came on and said that North Korea invaded South Korea, and it was a very serious situation. So I asked my dad, I said, where's Korea? He says, it's in Asia, I think. And I said, uh, well, and, and, I, and so <clears throat> we talked a little bit, and, and so when I got home, I uh, used an encyclopedia, which we used, not used to seeing anymore, and I looked up Korea, and I was interested in it, and I started following it. Then my dad told me, he said, when I was seven years old, he said, you know, you ought to start reading the newspaper. I never thought about it, so I started reading the newspaper, and I followed the Korean War that way and uh, all the way through, and, and that's how I learned about it. And uh, you subsequently served in the Army yourself uh, right. in, in the 60s. In the 60s, I was in Germany. And, and do you think that your experience as a young boy uh, with the Korean War beginning, uh, do you think that maybe planted the seed for you wanting to serve in the Army? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I wanted to be a Marine, but I knew that that wasn't gonna happen because I wore glasses, and at that time, the Marines didn't take people with glasses. So uh, I went into college and my dad told me, he says, always better to go in as an officer. And so I joined ROTC and I got commissioned when I graduated in 1963. And I uh, served, in the, uh, served in Germany for two years in the Quartermaster Corps. And, and so tell us how you came uh, to be a member of the Korean War Veterans Association. Uh, that's interesting, one of my friends 
uh, was a Korean, is a Korean War veteran. And uh, he said, would you go with me? He's kind of, he was kind of shy. I'm going on this thing. And I said, yeah, sure, I'll go. So I went and it was really, it was very, very welcoming and very nice. And I got up and I said, uh, you probably have to, when I introduced myself, I said, I'll have to tell you I was an officer and all the guys looked at me. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, um, and then it was a lot of camaraderie, a lot of history. Uh, people were very, very nice. Uh, and uh, they accepted me. And then about two years after I went there, and and uh, they and I started the I joined it and I paid my dues and <clears throat> the commander uh, left and uh, so they asked me if I wanted to be the commander and the reason that they did was is I'm about ten years younger than most of the others in there and no one wanted it so I did I took over as commander and I think I've been doing it for four years and it's been very satisfying the people that I've known and I've worked with are just absolutely terrific and uh, just really, really nice people. Well, I think it's incredibly important for people to share those stories. And, and I think it's great that, that you are, are helping a group of them uh, meet and do that. Um, Don, I want to turn back to you. Um, do you have opportunities now to, to reflect back, hearing a personal story like Susan's, to really kind of reflect back on the on the legacy of, of yourself and the others uh, in the United States Armed Services who, who served in Korea? Do you, you think about what that really means? Absolutely. The South Korean people, had, they actually can't do enough for us. They are so appreciative of what we did at that time. And uh, you have to be a Korean veteran to realize exactly how much they do for us. And we thank you, Susan. And you know, every veteran, the Korean veteran that we talk to says the same thing about South Korea. We did the right thing. And of course, I'm not able right now at my age, but I'd do it again. Well, Susan, you know, he talked about that, that legacy and, and it's been a long time ago. Um, how do you think uh, people living in America now understand it, or, or do they understand it? I think most people don't have any clue about the Korean War. Uh, all they know is about World War II in Vietnam, and that's very little. And schools right now, I think, are teaching very little about history as it is with military history. So Korea sits right in the middle of World War II in Vietnam, and it's always been in the shadows. And I think that's a primary reason why it's forgotten. Uh, so that is why, uh, one of the reasons why I decided to go on social media to reach a lot of people with Korean War history from the perspective of the veterans that I meet and interview and then from the perspective of Korean person who is here testifying to what they gave us, our freedoms. So I felt it was very important to put the voice of the Korean people with gratitude and honor for our American veterans. Certainly, we've, we've really, I think, just brushed the surface of, of an incredible topic, and you touched on the really the thousands and thousands and thousands of, of stories uh, there are that, uh, that you're helping to tell. Um, this question is really for all three of you, but um, what would you ask people who see this to do to, to honor those who served in the Korean War? It is the people who have been safe that need to thank our veterans. And to me, that's just basic. That is just basic, and that's such a small thing we're doing. But I think that's an important thing, is to learn the stories of the veterans. So I think you asked, well, what can the public do? I would say develop a curiosity about the Korean War. Go find Korean War veterans. Ask them their stories. Capture their stories. If you have a Korean War veteran in your family, an uncle or a father, please ask them. Because I know our Korean War veterans have long kept their mouth closed about the war. But I think part of it is because they don't see that anyone is interested. Susan, can you tell us the yes. name of your Facebook page so people could go and, and, uh, yes. and read some of these stories? Yes, my Facebook page is Susan Key Dash Honoring Korean War Veterans. And we'll share that on the screen for Thank our viewers so as well. But we also release this as a podcast. So for those who are listening uh, in their cars or while they're working around the house, um, uh, please give that page a visit. Uh, I just want to thank each of you. This has been a, a wonderful conversation, and, and we hope that 
that this gives a little bit more attention to a group of very, very worthy veterans, uh, Don and your, and your colleagues uh, who served in the Korean War. So uh, thank you for your service and thank you each of you for what you're doing to honor our, our Korean War veterans. The Korean War is sometimes referred to as the Forgotten War. It should not be that way. We hope that this interview encourages you to learn more and do more to honor veterans of the Korean War. We shift our focus now to our Arizona Veteran of the Month. Stephen Gardner is a native of Indianapolis who moved to Arizona in 2004. His 22-year Army career included two different periods of service and several positions, but Stephen served primarily as a senior NCO in the role of chaplain's assistant where he provided spiritual support and counseling to fellow soldiers. Stephen joined Hospice of the Valley in 2013 as a chaplain, where he has continued caring for fellow veterans. Stephen and his colleague Stacia Ortega joined us to talk about Hospice of the Valley's Saluting Our Veterans program. Did you know Bonnie before you went in the service or did you meet her after? We had been married for two years before I got my draft notice. Well, she's very much a veteran in my book too because you're a team, you know? Well, I couldn't have done it without her. Oh, that's awesome. I like to see him given the honor of what he did for our country. I think it's wonderful that, that you're able to do this and, and want to do it for our veterans. Yeah, they're both great parents and to see uh, the salute was, well, it, it means the world to to me, you'd be able to take the time and the effort to come out and thank veterans when, uh, when they're due and when they're at that stage. I just think it's, uh, it's an awesome program. I get thanked all the time, but this means, I know as much to me as it has to mean to the veteran. Being able to contribute and thanking them and honoring them, recognizing them for their service is just incredibly important. <music> Well, I mean, you can see tears in eyes, and uh, it's awfully, sometimes I've got to take my glasses off because they're all wet. Um, <laughs> I think we all grabbed a tear or two, because I'm still trying to hold it together myself, but uh, yeah, I think that was, you know, especially to see two officers salute each other, that's even, that's even more awesome. Thank you. I am joined here today by Stacia Ortega and Stephen Gardner uh, with uh, Hospice of the Valley. Thank you very much for being with me here today. Uh, for those of us who live in the Valley, uh, most of us are, of course, very familiar with uh, Hospice of the Valley and appreciate the wonderful programs and services uh, that your organization provides at, at what is a very difficult time in, in people's lives. Um, we're here this morning, though, to talk about the Saluting Our Veterans program. And uh, it's something that connects volunteers with veterans who are in hospice. So, Stephen, I'd, I'd like to start with you, um, Hospice of the Valley's chaplain and military liaison and a veteran yourself. Uh, thank you for your service. Uh, can you tell us about the Saluting Our Veterans program? Well, the program is designed to honor veterans who are at end of life and to give their families some sort of support or as well in terms of recognizing their loved ones, spent time in the service. And this is a, not just a token, not just a ceremony, but it's really an experience that makes that veteran feel really loved and really honored. If it's about honoring our veterans, what, what does that look like? So how does it take shape? Generally, we have a 
if we know what branch of the service they're in, we'll try to, you know, get a flag for that particular branch, whether it be, you know, Army or Marine or whatever it might be. Secondly, we have a pen, and the pen says, you know, we, uh, we honor you, you know, from Hospice of the Valley. And then sometimes, you know, besides that, we may give them a card or something that also speaks to that. And then while we're standing there at their bedside or if they're in their home, you know, with their family members, we actually render a salute. Sometimes team members, you know, that are actually serving that particular uh, patient will also be present. The social worker or the chaplain, maybe the nurse will be standing by and it's recorded so that the families can actually have a piece that they can remember a little bit later. Most of the time, we've always had some positive feedback in terms of the family really thanking us for what we're doing and especially thanking us for the service that we are uh, providing for their veteran loved one. You talked a little bit about uh, Vietnam veterans and, and maybe uh, something even more significant for, for many of those folks who are our our largest uh, population of veterans right now are Vietnam veterans. So um, how is it maybe especially meaningful for that group? Well, generally, you know, most of the time veterans hear the phrase, you know, thank you for your service, thank you for your service. That's kind of what we experience now uh, as veterans. But however, the politics was different when Vietnam veterans returned, you know, from, you know, from combat. They get off the plane, they were spat upon, they were called baby killers. They did not get this recognition. What we've done at Hospice of the Valley is to give a special recognition. Not only are we thanking them for their service, but we have another pen that's d designed just for those who are Vietnam veterans, and we tell them additionally, welcome home. So they finally get that, that welcome home that they didn't receive at the time. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, that's wonderful. Um, those of us who have served know how incredibly impactful that, that service is on the rest of our lives, even, even if you were in for only a brief period of time. So it seems like this program is, is an acknowledgement um, of how important military service is to someone. Is that your experience? Yeah, absolutely. It, absolutely true. Because, you know, for number one, the liberty that we have, that we experience in our country has been paid soldiers and airmen and Marines have paid the price and paved the way so we can enjoy that freedom. To be appreciated for that is huge. And when we have a veteran volunteer that can actually be there with that veteran near end of life, that connection is powerful because it lets them feel like that not only did the, not only did the um, contribution that I made in the military is meaningful, but now as I'm getting ready to exit this life, I can know for a fact that, that I did make a difference. And so we try to bridge that gap, you know, uh, toward the very end. Now, um, Stacia, you are the Hospice of the Valley's uh, Director of Volunteers. Uh, are you having success recruiting volunteers for this program? Yes, we have been very successful. Um, we do have a need for more veteran volunteers, so we would love to have more people join our team. Um, these volunteers are so highly committed to making sure that fellow veterans get this care. And um, we are happy to provide training and support to help uh, new veterans join our team. So we started our program back in 2011. And since that time, we've been able to honor over 3,000 veterans on our service. And, and what has the response been from the families and the veterans themselves? It's incredible. It's one of our most loved uh, programs. Um, I think, as Stephen pointed out, that as people face end of life, these um, our, our, our past experiences surface, and it's important for people to have a moment to connect with another veteran and be able to share that and be able to talk to somebody who really understands and has um, been in those similar shoes. So we, ha we get great response. We um, get so much gratitude from the families and for the patients themselves. And even patients who are not able to maybe articulate at the end of life, we've had patients that are nonverbal that actually will salute a veteran back during their visit. It's, it's just amazing. <laughs> well, it does sound like an amazing program. And I can tell you're both personally passionate about helping make these connections for veterans. Stephen, I know you also personally 
uh, have been at the bedside in, in some of these uh, situations. Um, are there any um, stories or examples of a particular, particularly meaningful interaction that, that you can recall or would like to share with us? I think one in particular is that sometimes these veteran volunteers, they have no family. You know, either all their families have gone or they may be the only one that's left. And so when I've been there and I had the opportunity to spend time with a veteran that near end of life, you look on their wall, you can see their ribbons, you can see their, uh, you can see their certificates, you can even see their uniform they have in the corner. And to have a veteran come in, like myself, to sit down with them, it really made that meaningful for them, but it also made it meaningful for me that I got a chance to join them on their journey and to be part of their last minutes of this time. Well, Stacia, um, how can someone out there who wants to help with this program, how can someone do that? They can go to our website at hov.org and under our volunteer tab, they, there's an application, there's information about our Saluting the Veterans program. They can contact us at um, 602-530-6900 and the volunteer department would be happy to talk with them and, and help them with next steps. And we're happy to have anybody join our team. Well, that's wonderful. Are, are there any other Hospice of the Valley uh, programs you would like to uh, talk about during our chat? Well, there's so many, but I will share with you that we had a spinoff of our Saluting the Veterans program, and it is our first responders program. And this idea came to us from one of our veteran volunteers who, uh, when he uh, retired from the military, became a police officer. And he, he came forward and shared that he felt that many first responders share similar experiences and um, felt that it would be important to have first responders visit first responders when they're at end of life. And so we um, started that program and we're very proud of it. It's called Honoring Our First Responders. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. I, I really appreciate everything that, that Hospice of the Valley does uh, uh, all the time, but certainly uh, this program to honor our veterans and first responders who many of, uh, many of our veterans also find careers as first responders. So um, thank you so much for everything you're, you're putting into this program. On behalf of Veterans AZ and Veterans Everywhere, thank you to Stephen and Stacia and all of the wonderful people at Hospice of the Valley for making this special effort to thank veterans in their care. The U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs created the VA Partial Claim Payment Program to assist veteran borrowers specifically impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. If you have a VA home loan and missed a payment because of COVID-19, you may be eligible for assistance. To learn more, contact your mortgage company or contact a Veterans Administration loan technician at 1-877-827 3702. Thank you for watching. Find full length interviews, past episodes, and more information at veteransaz.org. You can also find Veterans AZ in your favorite podcast app.